thanks everyone for coming to my session uh, today. Um, what we are going to be covering today is how we can build secure and scalable Git repos in Azure DevOps. Uh, Git repos within the Microsoft Source Control System have been around for a while, but through some of the acquisitions that Microsoft has acquired, one of the biggest ones being GitHub, um, a lot of features have come to the Git based repos that you find in Azure DevOps, um, both the service offering and then the server offering. So hopefully we'll go over some stuff that will help you um, as you try to administer or develop off these platforms. My name is uh, Josh Higginbotham. Uh, you can contact me at any point uh, at Codename SQL, which is my Twitter handle. Um, before we get kind of started, um, this event is being put on uh, based off of the UNICEF's effort towards COVID-19 relief for children. So, um, you know, donations are key to this. You know, many communities have been affected by COVID-19 and any support that the community can, can give, whether it's a dollar per, per attendee, goes a long way. Um, so any any support is appreciated. Sponsors. So as a community organizer of events myself, uh, we are unable to put these events on uh, without the help of these sponsors. Uh, a lot of uh, cost, or there there is a lot of cost to put these events on, and um, you know, all these sponsors come out, provide these these resources to us time and time again, and it helps us kind of share our knowledge throughout the community. So try to support them, um, any event that you go to. So a little bit about me. So I'm a data services manager at Republic Bank. Uh, data services is a kind of a fancy title for business intelligence, which is already a fancy title. Um, I am a Microsoft certified trainer and I am a certified Scrum Master. So uh, the certified Scrum Master, I spent a lot of my day in Azure DevOps working with dev teams, product owners, helping facilitate Scrum events. So I spent a lot of my time here and I, I, I get to find all the little things that cause kind of grief. And so that's where this, this session has been formed. Um, I'm a friend of Redgate, which Redgate is a software company that provides a lot of DevOps based tool uh, tooling towards the uh, SQL data platform. And I'm an Adara, uh, Adara Ace for 2020. Uh, they help support me in my, my speaking um, events. I'm the chapter leader of the Louisville Data Technology Group, formerly known as the Louisville SQL User Group. We are a PASS affiliate user group. Uh, we put on free training every single month um, and we're on Meetup and you can find us by that Louisville Tech Data Technology Group. Um, if you have any questions related to this session, Azure DevOps in general, um, you can find me at Codename SQL on Twitter. Uh, most of my code for demos will live on GitHub, uh, both at Jay Higgin, which is my personal account, or Codename SQL, which is my organizational uh, account, or you can email me at joshua.higginbotham at codenamesql.com. Feedback. Um, speaker feedback is is a really important metric for us. Um, I'm fairly new at speaking. Uh, this is my second year um, speaking within the community abroad. It helps us to understand what we need to change about our our demos, about our sessions. Do you want more demos, less discussion, stuff like that. It helps shape this training for the community uh, to be more beneficial. Same thing with event feedback. Event feedback is important to the organizers because they probably want to put on the event again and again and again, and the feedback they get, they read every single one of them, and they can adjust to make the event better for the people that attend to them. So please take time, uh, submit the feedback. Um, it does help to kind of shape the community uh, in the future. So topics covered. Um, so today we're going to go over the initial creation and configuration of a Git-based repo in Azure DevOps. Uh, prior to that, we'll go over a quick intro to Git, just to make sure that everybody understands why Git is a, a great source control model to go with. We'll then talk about securing your repo and branches. So I work in banking, and so 
security is a big thing for us and we want to make sure that our code is um, secured um, it's low risk as far as the changes that we're going to make and uh, people that shouldn't have access to it uh, don't have access to it uh, then we're going to go over branching strategies and if you've worked in git ever in your career branching strategies are usually where most people have trouble um, they can get complicated really really quickly and that's usually what causes people to kind of give up and go back to a more simplified branching structure and then if we have time which hopefully we will um, we will demo some of the third-party apps and integrations that i use uh, to help with my day-to-day -day, uh, operation within azure devops and git based repos so what is git so there's a ton of different source control tools out there you have uh, the VSVC model, you have Git base, you have SVN. Um, if you've been in tech long enough, you've probably worked with all three of them. Uh, and there's probably more of them out there. Uh, Git was first created uh, by the Linux community. And the reason why that was born and created was they were using a source control uh, tool called uh, BitKeeper. And there was a falling out between the community and BitKeeper um, where they removed the, the free licensing from them. So the Linux community banded together and said, we're going to build our own version of this. And uh, they did this around the 2005 uh, time frame. It's an open source um, source control system. So if you don't like to use the big names like uh, Azure DevOps, Git repos, uh github bitbucket whatever there's no reason you couldn't install the git server license or server uh offering on a linux server of your own windows server of your own and use that as your your central server for all your code um and that would be free uh the distributed source control model is what makes Git so important and so um famous within the community uh, that distributed source control model basically gives a copy of that repository with all history to each individual developer through these branches, whether they're local or remote. So we can have isolationism across all of our source control. So when you're in a multi-developer platform, uh, we can branch off, make changes in an isolated area, and then merge those without having any effect on additional developers hopefully. Um, it isn't always perfect. Um, this is one of those things where you have to kind of talk to people uh, throughout the process. So the first demo we're going to go over just kind of defines a little bit about Git, just to ensure that everybody um, is up to kind of speed with it. Let's see if I can get out of this. So I'm using Windows Terminal uh, to, to kind of work with this through a CLI. Um, there are various tools that you can use in VS Code, Visual Studio itself. Um, th there's just a lot out there. So to kind of illustrate what we're talking about, um, I'm going to create, oops, I'm going to create a new folder. And then I'll move to that folder, make sure that it's empty. And then I'm going to initialize this as a Git-based folder structure. And so what this is doing is marking this folder as a Git-based repository locally on my machine. So now anything that lives within this can now be tracked through version control. So we can create a new file. Uh, do a git status to see what's going on. And we see that we have this new untracked file called file.txt. Natively, git does not automatically track things. Um, so we have to tell it we want to add something. So we'll do a git add. And we can be 
objective and just add everything. And be implicit and add what the specific file that you want to touch. And we see that we have this file.txt um, now in a staged area. So that green basically says that, hey, you've added this to the, the Git repo as far as we're tracking this now. If you were to commit and stage these tra changes, this would be a part of that. Now, when we're talking this isolation of code and we want to shift because a bug has been reported from our business analysts or our stakeholders or something like that, and we need to shift quickly. We don't want to have to go out and spin up a, a hotfix environment in a, you know, that could take an hour or so. Uh, Git allows us to kind of create these, these branches off of things. So um, the first thing I need to do is either commit this change or stash it. And that allows us to kind of move around without that change uh, following us along. So I'm gonna commit everything that is in a, in a um, track state, give it a, com a descriptive commit message, um, Do we get status? And we see that there's nothing left to commit, that everything is 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 committed to our local environment. So then I need to make a change. We'll do a git checkout git checkout dash b, which basically says we're gonna check out a brand new branch that isn't created. give it a branch name, and it automatically checks it out. So then we'll create a new file called touch, or sorry, um, using the touch command. And take a look at that. So again, another file that has been tracked. So we can go through the same process. We'll add it. We'll commit it to our bug branch. And if we go to our, our folder in File Explorer, right now we see we have, and I messed up the, uh, the file extension on my first one, but we see we have two files and Basically what's happening is this file explorer is showing you the state of that repository under the bug fix one branch that we're seeing here. Now, I wanna just kind of show where this isolationism kind of comes from. So I can go check out or get check out, go to our, our main branch. So now we're back to that main branch and we see we only have that file.txt um, file that we created under that that main branch when we we first started. And so we can kind of shift from branch to branch locally um, as issues pop up as code changes, you know? And so this, this kind of gives us some flexibility um, that we don't see in some of the other source control models. So that's kind of one of the biggest benefits I, that I find as a developer, being able to kind of work with this stuff. Cool. Ah, I always mess that up. All right, so now we're we, we, we're getting into the actual core of the the discussion here um, around the initial creation and configuration of a Git based repo. Um, in general, uh, with any type of repo structure, whether it's you know a, a different type of source control model or not, there's some considerations we need to uh, address, question you know answer and address um, before we get started. This helps when we start to try to secure that repository and scale it as time goes on. So some of these, these considerations that we're gonna be looking out for are, who's gonna be accessing the repository? Is it going to be just development 
Is it going to be the BAs, your or sorry, your business analysts, your QA testers, the stakeholders, whatever it's going to be, will dictate your security model. Uh, what is the purpose of that repository? So I've, I've worked for organizations that they will create one overarching repository and keep all of their code contained within that that core repo. So every time you're branching your code, you're taking every code that lives in your enterprise with it. You're creating a whole copy of it, every bit of history, and then you wonder why it takes long to create these branches or you're dealing with merge conflicts left and right because somebody touched a, a, a file or a program that they shouldn't have. So you want to build your repositories to be kind of as small as possible. You you know, if, if you have um, a certain platform that has analytical models, you may want to create a repository called platform that platform name analysis models and only store what what takes up to create these analysis models. Um, hopefully that that also brings you down to where it's only one or two developers working on that. That way that that way there's not this huge communication issue when 10 or 15 developers are trying to merge code all at the same time and you run into this issue sometimes in git it's it's who can commit first who can who do who can do a pull request first um, wins and so you can kind of help alleviate that by creating your repos um, based off of a, a set item set application um, what type of code is going to live in your repository so uh, not, not every code is alike, and so if you have a repository that's full of mergeable base code, so stuff like SQL scripts, PowerShell scripts, Python scripts that can do merges through through the interface, that can live a little bit more harmoniously with stuff. But if you start looking at like SQL Server integration packages, Power BI files, um, SSRS files, those are not mergeable um code bases and so you run into a risk when you you have this larger repo with all these these items in it that josh is developer one and and dan is developer two if they're working on the same ssis package and both of them commit and, and commit their change push it up to the remote and try to do pull requests Dan's code will go in just fine, and then I'm going to overwrite his code when I push my changes and, and do a pull request because they're not mergeable. So those are some of the kind of coding, the code type, application type considerations you got to have. That's usually what burns people. Um, you know, the, the quickest way to, to <laughs> make your developers mad is to waste hours of development that they didn't have. Now, the benefit is, is you have that code locally. So hopefully you can reproduce your changes, but it's still going to take you opening up one of those copies and manually merging that code to kind of get it in. Um, when will the code be released and how? So how how effective are you at iterating through your your changes? So are your sprints three weeks, two months? I, I've even seen somebody that you know, it's it's been years, but they worked for an airline company and they the system that he worked on for the airline uh, only went to production every six months. And so you end up having a ton of code that piles up in in this pipeline and you're releasing it all together. Uh, that can can be an issue when you you have this larger repo structure because you're 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 going to have to evaluate risk and and do like an impact analysis because it's going to when you push that code up that pipeline to broad it's going to have a larger effect than you would see if you were doing one small repo at a time until you got it through so our next demo is we're going to go up in azure devops um, so azure devops is just another offering of a remote um, offering of git uh, again, you can use um, anyone you want. Most of them all have free plans now. Uh, GitHub is owned by Microsoft. Um, and some of these features that you find and you love in GitHub are starting to kind of come to the Azure DevOps Git-based process. Most enterprise environments, I think, are, are still on Azure DevOps. Um, so you may find it easier to migrate your code from one of the old 
uh, I think it's VSVC models to a Git based repo. Uh, so you can kind of sell the business a little bit better. So um, when you go in Azure DevOps, we go into whatever project this repository is going to sit in. So I have a demo um, project. And then from there, we go to our repos tab. And in our repos tab, we'll have a drop down up top that lists out all of our repositories, whether they're the traditional VSVC model or they are uh, Git based repos. They'll all be listed here. We'll go to new repository and we can choose what our repository type is going to be, whether it's going to be Git or the TFVC model. We'll give it a descriptive name. Um, to tell it what it's what this repository is about. By default, the add a readme file is checked. We want to always provide a readme file in any Git based repo that we have. And we'll kind of touch on that in a second. And then there's a add a dot git ignore file. Dot git ignore was one of the the areas of Git that kind of confused me at first. You know, in my head is like, why would you ever want to ignore something? Uh, part of that could be you have an environment config file that stores your connection strings to your application. You want to make sure that a developer locally hasn't modified that environment config and hard coded uh, credentials into his config locally and doesn't push that up putting your system at risk. So you may have a .git ignore file that has that environment.config file naming convention in it so it keeps your developers from being able to uh, make changes to that and commit those changes. They can make them locally, it just will not be a part of their commit. Um, right now we're going to leave it at none and we're going to create this. Um, by default, what it's going to do is going to create a branch called master and we can rename that to anything we want. Um, there are no dependencies to that name and uh, we'll go over that in a minute on how we can do that. Uh, without causing any issues, um, but the default view is going to be whatever the default branch is. So we change that to something else. It'll it'll show up there as that that branch name, and then we see our readme dot markdown. It's a markdown file that kind of allows us to use HTML type uh, dialect to create kind of an instruction. What is this repository for? Um, helpful tips, you know, like who is the core developer, who is the secondary developer, who is the project manager, BA, what, whatever you want about this and how you can contribute to it. So like in open source, you're going to see a lot of instructions here on how how can you contribute, whether from a development standpoint, triage, whatever, kind of gives people instructions on what you can do with this, this product. Um, you may want to put uh, code of conduct, developer, developer code of conduct in here. That way, if somebody comes in and does something malicious, you have the means to deal with that. Um, and there's no no if, ends, or buts. Um, so we'll go in and we want to rename the default branch that was created. By doing that, we go to repos, branches. We'll create a new branch. We'll give it a name. So I like to use the uh, branch name main. We base it off of that original default branch. We'll create that branch and then we have to set it as our default. So basically by setting this as our default, it also sets it as a comparison branch. So any pull requests that come through will automatically use this main branch as its right limit, its right um, comparison area. We'll then delete this branch and we've kind of done our base configuration. Um, and we can start working towards securing this, this, this platform. So when we talk about securing our platforms or securing our repos, um, the first thing we want to do is again, who is going to access this repository? What are they going to be doing with it? Um, and we always want to try to set our permissions around the lowest setting necessary to do their job. So a business analyst shouldn't have the ability to push code. That's not their role, but they need to be able to manage, you know, tasks, requirements, features, whatever you're, you're working with, whether it's the CMMI process or the agile process, whatever you're using, they need to have that, that ability to do that. 
uh, set permissions to a group rather than a set user. So a lot of organizations, I'm guilty of it at times, um, I know most people are, they like to set permissions to a user level. Um, that makes maintaining this a lot difficult or a lot more difficult. Um, we can create groups within Azure DevOps, so that way we just add users to the groups and those permissions automatically take hold. We don't have to go through and add custom policies and, and permissions around their, their set account. And the most important part, please, please break the inheritance from the global setting. Um, I'm sure there are people out there that will will throw their arms up and say, why, why would you ever do that? Um, what I have been burned by in the past, relying on that global inheritance, is I'm not the only project administrator for our, our project. So another project administrator comes in, decides to make a change to a set group or a set um, area, and next thing you know it, I'm losing access to, to that repository to be able to do what I'm doing. Um, because they're not evaluating what does this security change have as an effect across every repository and every project. So I, by default, always break that inheritance and set permissions in an implicit fashion. And of course, if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the Q&A and then we can kind of talk to them or talk through them in a little bit. Um, so our next demo is going to be about setting up these permissions. So we have a couple um, areas that we need to address. Uh, one is at the repository level and one is at the actual branch level. Um, so first off, we need to go to permissions and we need to create these groups. By default, you'll have these um, groups created when you create a new project in Azure DevOps. Um, ma the majority of people that join a um, Azure DevOps project are automatically set as a contributor. This is where most people end up getting burned by people having access they shouldn't because contributors by default have the ability to push code. And so you end up having BAs and stakeholders and all that that can modify your code base, which is not good from an audit standpoint. So we'll create a new group. And then we have to define the members that are going to be a part of this. Give it a description. That way, if somebody's trying to figure out what this, this group is for, they at least have an idea. You can even put a owner of this group is whoever whoever is leading that team. That way they can kind of see within this description who is who to go to. Now that we have our permission group kind of set, we can go into our repositories, select the repository that we want to make changes over, and then we'll go to permissions. So here is that inheritance I was talking about. So we can kind of see in our contributors that they have contribute, contribute a pull request, create branch, create tag, manage notes, and read. I want to break this inheritance. That way I can modify these. By default, what I tend to do, and, and this is going to be subjective to the environment that you're working in, the, the company you're working for, I am going to um, change these to not set. And by doing so, um, we're limiting what they can do. So I'm going to allow them to contribute to the pull request because I want them to, to have the ability to make comments, make some changes to them, stuff like that. Maybe even approve them if they need to. Because our policy may say, you know, the BAs need to approve a pull request along with dev management and so forth. They shouldn't be able to create a branch or a tag. They can't manage notes and I want them to be able to read. So they can come through and look at the history on the code, see what's in, embedded in it, if they need to do an impact analysis, whatever. And then we need to add our newly formed group. So we can type in um, and put that light up dev. And we're going to go in, add the contribute to both the pull request and the regular. We're going to allow them to create branches, create tags. They're going to be able to read, manage notes, and, and we're set. 
um, you will see that you'll probably want to create some elevated groups. So you may have a light up admin and that light, light up admin would have all these same uh, permissions, but they'll have this force push uh, permission allowing them to delete branches, delete tags. Um, there may be at times that you need to go up and clean up some of the branches that are in the remote, but you don't want your general developers having access to do that. So now that we have these permissions set, we need to go and set policy based um, or branch policies. So what branch policies allow us to do is to set um, certain policies around what can be done within a branch. The second you enable a branch policy, you cut off the ability to push code directly to it. Um, this allows us to, in a quick fashion, um, you know, control risk to our platform. So the only way you can introduce code is through a pull request from one branch to another, whether that is a topic based branch or a feature branch or whatever you want to call it. So we're going to add a branch policy to our main branch. We're going to tell it that we want um, a minimum number of reviewers before it can be um, completed. I'm going to set this to one. We can change it to where um, requesters are allowed to approve their own changes. You may find that this is necessary at times, especially if you're the um, the only developer on on duty at that day and you end up having some issues. Um, but it can really be about anybody there there's ways that we can force certain approvers to be um, added um, and that's later down on this path but if your platform is very very sensitive so you're you're making a change to your ach processing system something that if a if a incorrect change went in would have a huge effect on your platform you may want to increase this to three reviewers something along those lines and those three reviewers may be your dev manager your ba manager and compliance or something like that these are things that your your company is going to define so we'll set this to one We're, we want to make sure that we have work item linking so that we can see a history of changes across our platform again i work for an fdsc regulated bank or fdsc insured not regulated uh bank and so we have to provide an audit trail when you know when did this go to production we have to be able to do a forward and backwards trail along those items so we want to ensure that a pull request has linked work items um, included in this pull request to, to know what 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 request triggered this pull request you know what change we want to make sure that we have comment resolution so if i'm in this pull request and I, I find something that I don't like and I want to adjust it, I can put a comment saying, hey developer, please adjust this before I'll approve this and complete this uh, pull request. Once they update their pull request with those changes, I can go in and mark those as resolved in the comments and that policy will evaluate as true and we can move on. So this is just making sure that somebody can't just go through the process and approve it without anybody noticing. Um, there's ways that we can um, trigger a build on a pull request and that build will have to run successfully before the pull request will allow it to um, complete and close out. Um, and then um, we'll skip the status checks, but the automatically including reviewers, here is where we can add set individuals that we want to approve this. Again, this can be a group. This is what I would suggest is a group. In this uh, demo, I'm gonna set myself as a uh, optional reviewer. So this will add me as a reviewer, but it isn't a requirement. So if I change this to required and Dan the developer adds somebody else as a reviewer and I'm marked as required, I still have to review it, even though the policy says only one is required. So you want to make sure that you understand what the difference is along those. Um, we can add filtering. So I can say, you know, uh, like one of my predominant roles is ETL. So if I am, uh, if the pull request falls under a folder structure that has SSIS in it, Josh Higginbotham will be added as a reviewer, but Tom the manager 
is over analytics and reporting. So if it falls under the reporting folder within the repo, add Tom as a reviewer. And so this is kind of a way that you can have ownership within within the structure and making sure the right people approve those changes because they, they they own that platform, they they maintain it or whatever, and you want to make sure that they're reviewing those changes. So we'll save this. And um, by default, all this stuff is saved once you enable it or disable it. We'll go to our branches within our repos. And any branch that has a branch protection on it will have this little ribbon. And if you hover over it, it'll tell you that this branch has policies. Now, we don't want to have to do this every time we create new branches. So what we can do is we can create um, kind of a structure around this. So um, what I can do is create a new branch under a folder structure. And to be able to create a folder structure within your branches screen, you'll type out what the folder name is going to be. You'll do forward slash. And then you'll give it whatever the branch name would be. So in this case, I'm going to do IT1. We're going to base it off the main branch and we're going to create this. So now we see within our branch um, branches screen that we have a folder called sprints and underneath that we have an IT1 branch. So one, this is a way to organize our branches. That way, if you've got a 10 person development team that are creating branches along this, this platform, you can see, um, see stuff in a more uh, organized fashion. But we want to make sure that anytime we create a new branch underneath this sprints folder, it automatically inherits the branch policy that we set. So we'll go to project settings, we'll go back to repositories, click light up comp our um, uh, repo. Um, uh, go to permissions and then we'll select the uh, I'm a little lost, sorry guys. Do this. All right, so when we click this sprints folder, we see this sprint slash asterisk, which is a wild card. And so what we're going to do is we're going to set these same policies that we found before. So we'll uh, set it to one review required, linked items are required, comments are required to be resolved before we will allow it to be approved. We'll add an automatic reviewer of Josh. We'll set Josh as optional and we'll save it. And when we go back to our IT1 branch, we see that there's an inheritance and we see that the policy inherits settings from one other and we can click this and it will show us what this inheritance is. So it's saying configured on the light up conference conf repository and it applies to any branch that falls under the sprint slash asterisk, which is a wild card. So any branch you put underneath that sprints holder will inherit this this policy. So this is a way of us making sure that our policies are always there. There's no risk in us. Um, creating new repositories up in the remote without getting these policies. Um, if you're an administrator of this repository, you'll you'll be glad to have this, um, especially if it's a highly iterative um, area. So scaling your repository. So um, scaling is is tough in, in general. Um, you know, you only know what you know now. Um, and so scaling is is similar. Scaling a, a Git based repository is similar in nature to scaling a, an application. You want to try to understand what this this repository is going to look like in a year two years, three years, whatever. Um, the larger that repository grows, you may run in some, into some risk, especially if you're, you're thinking about putting Power BI files that have 
um, import data sources. So that model, that data is stored within the model in your Azure DevOps repository. It's a big no-no in my eyes, but um, I'm not going to get onto that topic. Um, but then your your repo folder structure is going to grow and grow and grow, and you're going to start seeing some kind of, some kind of issues there. Um, so we, we start off by having confined and defined repo structure. So this kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier, where we want to make sure that our repositories um, are confined to what what the core process is going to be. So you know if you create if you've got a you know e a handful of ETLs and databases that make up your your operational data store for your data warehouse, you may create a repository for that that specific ODS. Or you may have um, that platform analytics repository, and that's going to store all of your Power BI analysis, Python analysis, stuff like that. So we're kind of isolating it through that. Then we want to make sure that we can isolate our changes through branching. And um, Azure DevOps does a really, really good job at this, um, probably better than some of the others that I've seen, where I can create a branch and link that branch um, to the work items that are going to be affected by this. And so from an audit and compliance standpoint, there's this history across both the dev work items, QA work items, whatever you're using, uh, those requirements, features, epics, whatever that you're using within your um, your uh, development process, whether it's CMMI, um, Agile. And then now we've got this link to our branches and in Git we also have our links to our pull request. So every time you're touching that code and moving that code around, there is some relationship formed and there's this audit trail that makes things a lot easier for you that you probably didn't see in the VSVC models. Um, and then we can set up notifications for all activities. So we can do that in Azure DevOps. There are third party type tools that most of us use, whether it's um, Slack for team communication, MS Teams, like what we're using for this live event. We can be notified when changes are made to both those work items, to our uh, repository as a whole. Um, when pull requests are created, builds are kicked off, releases, whatever you, you're, you're doing. So that's where we're talking about this scaling. We wanna always make sure that our repositories kind of grow with us. And we wanna make sure that as we grow, we don't hit hurdles that are gonna keep us from being able to do that. So what we'll do is we will go in and Make sure that we have an iteration or a sprint that is defined for this window. So we have one that's running from 7.13 to 8.3. We're going to go to our Azure board screen. So this is where all of our work is contained. We'll go to the sprint that we're going to be working on. And we see that we have two requirements out here. So we want to do an update to our readme file uh, that lives within this, this code base. Um, by default, it was created with that, that generic template. So to create this relationship, we're going to go to this development window within the uh, requirement screen, and we're going to create a branch. This can be done after the fact. So if somebody creates a branch through the normal process, and you want to link it, all you have to do is in the same text here, just hit branch and then you tell it the repository and what branch you're going to work from in this. So we're going to create a branch. We're going to name this whatever we want. So traditionally what I'll do is I'll put in what type of work item it is, a shortened form of it. I'll put in the number for that requirement so I know specifically what this branch is for. And then um, I'll put in, you know, a plain text descriptive nature of what's going to happen. So we're going to do update readme. We're going to base it off the light up conf repo. We're going to base it off of our sprint slash IT1 because that's the iteration that we're in. 
And because we created the requirement from that window, it automatically creates that relationship to that requirement work item. So we'll create the branch. And by default, it goes to the um, repository that we're working on. And we see we have our requirement 35 dash update readme. We will pull, or sorry, do a clone of this locally. Just to kind of illustrate a little bit of a difference between the tools, we'll go to Visual Studio. Hopefully, uh, this will load quick. We will go to our Team Explorer. Hit this, I call it a fork. I think it's a power plug or whatever. It's a connector. Um, we'll go Manage Connections. And this will look at any account or any repository, or sorry, <laughs> Azure DevOps, um, uh, account that you have, project that you have, and kind of list it out. So I'm going to choose this light up conf repo. It'll by default use this source repo or user source repos path. That's fine. So we'll clone this locally. I have to sign in. So this is another security setting that's set that I have to authenticate to our repository up in the remote to ensure that we're kind of working with this or have access to this. And then we'll go look at our branches. So by default, it only pulled that main branch down, but we see that we have in our remote, we have our requirement 35, we have our sprints folder with our IT one. To pull this down locally so I can make these changes, I'll right click this branch. I'll do new local branch from and I'm going to leave this as default. So I'm going to check it out automatically and I'm going to immediately track it in the remote. So there's a relationship bet formed between my local uh, copy of this repository and the remote. Create the branch. And we see down here below. Um, hopefully I can remember how to do this. Hey, there we go. So we see down below in Visual Studio, it gives us a context that we're in. So we see that we're under the, the light up conf repo and our branches requirement 35 dash update readme. It's the same concept as when we're working in SQL, we want to make sure that we're going to hit F5 on execute against the right server, right platform. You know, it's a really, really bad day when you run a delete script against your stage environment instead of your production environment and you intended to delete data in, in prod or whatever. Uh, hopefully you don't have access directly to prod, but we just want to ensure that when we make changes, we're going to commit those changes to the right branch. Um, we'll go to our source control explorer. We can double click this readme file and we can make a modification to this. So we'll save that. And we'll see this red check mark saying we've made a change to this. We'll go to our changes. We'll put in a descriptive commit message. But before we do that, we want to make sure that we're linking this work item. So um, if we do a pound sign, what it'll do is it'll it'll go through and it'll parse Azure DevOps and grab all the work items that are there, and we can kind of see what what's available. So I see that I have this update.readme um, task work item. So I'm going to put that there, and it's going to relate this change to that. So now we've created a uh, an audit trail to the task that we're working on. Give it a descriptive commit message. We're going to verify that we're pointing to the right branch locally. We're going to commit that change. And then that change is now committed and stored locally, but we want to make sure we get this code up to our remote environment so we can can update 
the README in our our remote environment so people know what we're doing. So I can click this outgoing commit to see, yeah, Josh made this. He made this at 9.50 p.m. It's going to have an effect on this work item, and he changed the, the README file. We'll push this change, and we see that we successfully pushed to the origin, which is our remote requirement 35-update README branch. We'll go to our branches. We'll go to this requirement 35-update readme. And we see within our readme, we have that modification test change that we made. So we're ready to introduce this change. We need to create a new pull request. So within this pull request screen, which falls under the repos, we see that, hey, recently you just changed, or you just did something in this requirement 35-update branch. You wanna go ahead and create a pull request. Um, if you don't want to use this, you can by all means go to the new pull request and it's going to basically do the same concept. We tell it what is our left comparison branch, which in this case is that requirement 35. Our right limit is going to be what environment or what branch we want to pull this code into. So as we're working on a sprint, we want to move all of our changes into the sprint based branch. So that way we can release from there to our lower environments, whether it's a QA stage and main is only brand, or merged in a, through a pull request when we want to go to production. Main is a representation of what we have in production. We see that we have in our pull request, we have an update readme um, as what was changed. Um, it inherits the commit message that you um, committed locally you want to make sure this has descriptions on what was changed, why it was changed, how you're going to test it. You want to make sure that this pull request has everything needed to ensure that this is going to get approved. The last thing you want to do is go through all this effort, um, go lazy on this side, and then whoever is approving this denies it automatically because it doesn't have enough info. If you wanted to add additional approvers, you could do it here, but because our policy has an automatic addition, we can leave this alone. And we see because we're going from our requirement 35 uh, branch has a link to the requirement, this shows up in our pull request. So the approver knows that, hey, this is gonna have an effect on the update.readme um, or the, the readme.md file. And all the work was done against this task. Um, traditionally, all these, act, all these tasks would be in an active state, um, but for this demo, we're just gonna leave it alone. We'll create this. And we see that we already have a policy that's kind of pending. So we see that at least one reviewer must approve before this can be um, completed. It has an effect on this update.readme task. I can go to the files, see what files were changed, what are the updates across the um, commit pipeline. And we can see what the commits were. I can click this and it'll give me a, a differential. We'll go back to our overview. And then from here, I can say, you know, please provide a better PR description and put this comment in. So now we see that a policy has now been flagged as, as it's failed. And it's failed because the comments must be resolved. So I would come in and I would redo my pull request um, to have a more descriptive um, nature of what's being changed. And then as that that reviewer, I'll come in and I'll say, hey, this this looks fine. So I'm going to resolve it. And now we see that that policy um, succeeds and we can kind of move on. We'll approve it. And then we can complete this. Uh, something's not right. Oh, uh, it's because I am the. Um, the only person. So our policy says that I, as the developer, cannot be also the approver of this. Um, so let's see if we can update this real quick. We're, we're kind of running on time. Um, so we'll go to the light up comp. We'll go to our IT1 branch policy, or sorry, we're going to go to our sprint policy. 
And for this demo, we're going to enable us allow requesters to approve their own changes. And hopefully this takes takes effect. Go back to pull request. Go to back to that pull request and we see, hey, it's now in resolve state. We're going to complete this. And we have some settings that we can enable. So I want to go ahead and complete out these work items that way. Um, from a work item perspective, nothing's remain or nothing is kept um, open. We can delete that branch if we want to. I normally do not do a deletion through this process. I'll leave a branch around for a couple days, a week, whatever I need to, to ensure that there's no reason I need to go back to it. Git does keep history when you create these merges, so you at least have the history, but it's nice to have that branch around just in case for a little bit. We can customize the merge uh, commit message if we want to add some additional detail, but for this case, we're just going to complete the associate work items. We'll complete the merge, and we'll get this loading message. And this is a little bit of a, a gotcha within uh, the pull request. The pull request is actually complete, but there's a little bit of a bug here. And so this will continue loading and loading and loading um, until you finally just go out and re refresh the screen and you see that it, it merged just fine. And we'll get a completed message saying, hey, all is well. And we can come back to our pull request and we can see the history of what was completed and, and whatever. Um, notifications uh, can be set up through um, through your teams. Um, all of the notifications through a third party app are going to require um, personal access tokens, the majority of them. To create tokens, um, you'll go under the little user settings, go personal access token, generate a new token. And then you have to give it an expiration and what access that you'll be granting. Um, be careful about what you grant, um, especially if you don't know what um, support is going to be there. Um, the last thing you want to do is grant permissions to something with read, write, and manage that um, opens up a hole within your platform. So uh, for notifications, all you'll ever need is that read access. Additional tools and integrations. Um, so these are just some tools that I use um, for database um, tools to, you know, work with source control within my database. I use Redgate SQL Source Control. Uh, Change Automation is another product that they have. Uh, some additional third-party tools are Idera Safe, Apex Source, um, and then you have the free version, which is SQL Server Data Tools. Uh, there were a couple sessions today that covered SQL Server Data Tools. It's been around for a long time, and it's still being developed on. Um, then some of the Azure DevOps extensions I use are Calendar, which is kind of a, a month-long calendar add-in to Azure DevOps. It's a Microsoft DevTools um, extension. It's a free tool, but it allows me to see um, everything from one window. So I can see all the iterations. Um, when you're setting capacity on your iterations or sprints, if you call them sprints, um, it'll show who has time off. And then you can add events so you can add like on this date we're going to do a release so it kind of helps your team understand where everything's at retrospectives is one of the scrum events um, that is another add-in from the microsoft dev team it allows you to have actionable items from your sprints and then for time tracking um, i use seven pace um, i'm not affiliated with seven pace i don't benefit from them it's just a great tool uh, one of the biggest uh, pain points for developers is inputting their hours and it allows you to add in this add-in that has a mobile app, a desktop app, where you can track all your time related to your work items all from a timesheet Excel file looking thing. And there's reporting and analytics against it and it's, it's a really good tool. Um, so outside of that, that's all I have. Um, if you have any questions, I know we're kind of close on time. Uh, feel free to ask them in the Q&A. If not, um, I will go back up here to my contact info. And you're welcome to message me on any of these platforms, whether it's Twitter or email. 
um, and I'll, I'll be happy to help out. I've, I've been in IT for about eight years in various roles, and I've been bit by about everything you can get bit by, it seems like. So um, if there's no questions, um, thank you for coming to my session. There's a great lineup still coming, so hopefully you'll uh, you'll find time to get out there and, and, and see what, what other speakers are prepared to show. <laughs>